And good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you may be. And welcome back to our weekly gathering. And uh, if you're out there, say hello. And uh, if you're not out there, you can't. Shelley, you're the first on today. And uh, welcome to you from Mount Nebbin. Isn't it a lovely day here in Pittsburgh? Hello, Robert from Fort Lauderdale. We're having a lovely day, but I bet it's warmer there. Yoke, hello. From the Netherlands. John Henry, hello. Indiana, PA. You see, we encompass the globe. Today, Pittsburgh. Tomorrow, Thorpe. Lovely to have you all back with us. Let's see else who's out there while I sip my coffee. Ah, Dennis from Greensburg, hello to you. Welcome back. And Fitz Jamie. David, always reliable. Good to hear see you. Well, at least see that you're there. Since I can't see you, but you can see me. Yes, we have a sponsor for today's for today's edition, and uh, thank you to her. Always remember, you're very welcome to sponsor. You're very welcome to donate, but most of all, you're very welcome. And uh, there's the details if you are interested. We'll be pumping them up again, so there's no escape. You can't say you didn't know how. Information is everything. Ah, hello, Grace. Yes, I'm well, and uh, and I'm delighted with myself because I got my first vaccination two days ago. Oh, hallelujah. Another one in three weeks' time, and then two weeks after that, I can... Rule the world, they say. <sighs> and it's really very painless. You know, got lots of vaccines over the years, but actually it was remarkably painless. A little discomfort in the arm the next morning, that was it. And I slept very well that night. I wonder if that was part of it. Yes, Grace, it is fantastic news. Hooray for vaccines, <laughs> indeed. There's an old motto amongst older actors, and, and I'm now nearly an older actor. Uh, and the old motto is, if there's a drug to take to help you out, take it. The great rule is be able to get on stage. Yes, Robert, I like to think that I do. It's a little personal dream of mine. <laughs> um, and I try very hard to live up to it. Um, master of the universe would be me, my next ambition. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm beyond that now, or it's beyond me. I keep discovering the universe is bigger than they thought it was. And then they tell you it's smaller, so it's it's possible for me. But I don't know. I'll stick with the world and everything that's in it. Ah, oh dear. I keep looking down at my notes. Forgive me. Ah, oh dear. So, who else is out there? Nobody's saying hello to me today. And here I am. I'm always... Um, I love the fact that uh, people do gather together with me at uh, 2 p.m. on Fridays. Pittsburgh time, but I'm also delighted that so many people who can't make it do go to the website and take a look at it on YouTube later in the day or later in the week. And uh, if, you, if you're a regular uh, live broadcast person, do tell your friends that they can see it, uh, you know, by going to our website, getting onto our YouTube channel 
and they can see it. And um, the the old uh, webinars from last year are all they're slowly being uploaded. The, uh, dear Catherine is the one who's uploading them, and she is very busy because uh, she also runs the company. But uh, we will have them all up, and all the blocks of of, of various um, past webinars are going up onto the site now. So hopefully in the next few weeks, everything will be up there. Hello, Marlene. Yes, the sunshine is lovely, isn't it? The daffodils are beginning to poke through. The crocuses are out already. There's a sense of spring in the air, but it is Pittsburgh, so it'll probably snow next week. But for the moment, it's a beautiful day. And I would ask, why aren't you out enjoying it? But then if you were, you wouldn't be listening to me. And then that mean I'd be sitting here wasting my time. So, hello Eva, raining in Dublin. Oh, what a surprise. Uh, but uh, no, I'm, I don't mean that. I, you have my sympathy. Dublin can be beautiful when it's sunny on those rare days in the year, usually Thursdays. So as I say, today's, today's webinar is sponsored. If anybody's out there interested in sponsoring, do let us know. We'll be happy to send you the details. It's not overly expensive, but uh, we always we always welcome any support that you can give us. Even a few dollars all matters because in this day and age, um, every dollar counts. When you haven't got box office, every single dollar counts to keep us going. Um, and the webinars, although free and always will be, uh, they still cost us money to produce them, so that's why we do look for sponsors, and uh, we are very, very deeply grateful to anybody that does sponsor. This this week's um, is sponsored by uh, Sandra uh, Williamson, and Sandra, thank you so much for taking the trouble, taking the time, and writing the check. It, uh, we really do appreciate it, um, and it is important, because in order to produce something free, it has to be paid for. <laughs> And uh, it is people like yourself who uh, who help to make these things possible. And we want to keep them going for as long as there are people who are willing to tune in and listen. We have a lot of things that we're planning to talk about in the coming year and a lot of interesting people to meet, uh, as well as self, because um, you might be getting tired of me by now, but we've got a lot of interesting people um, that we're going to talk to in the course of uh, this year as it passes. Um, so, how are we doing? Oh, oh goodness me, it's gone two o'clock. We should really begin. Actually, on that very topic, um, uh, webinars and broadcasts have a wonderful way of coming back to bite you. Uh, one of the things I, I very frequently say about these, these, uh, these sessions is that everything I tell you may be wrong. All I'm telling you is my opinion, my experience, uh, what is in my knowledge base. But never ever take, it's, it's a golden rule about education. Never believe what one teacher tells you, check it up yourself. And uh, you may end up knowing more about it than I do. And that'd be great. Because the purpose of the webinars is to broaden your uh, experience and to broaden your wisdom on the topic. And I always advocate that whatever I say, go and check it out because I may be wrong. And I'd be delighted if you tell me that I am, because then I'll learn something. Uh, but as I say, they, they tend to come back at you. A friend of mine in Dublin actually told me that uh, a couple of days ago, she was listening to the radio, and there was me on the Irish National Broadcasting uh, Service talking about King Lear, which is an interview I must have done at least 15 years ago. And I'd love to know what I said, because by now I probably disagree with it completely. But they come back to bite you. Uh, once you've committed yourself to uh, electric media, you're there forever, and uh, there's no denying it. Anyway, this week we're going to talk somewhat about the evolution of the stage. And this isn't a lecture or a history lesson, it's an observation. As I say, all I did tend to try, what I try to do is to give you my view, my opinion, my feelings about matters theatrical. And this one is, uh, I think, rather intrinsic and fundamental. 
Last week, we talked about filling the empty space, the, the, the methodology of design, how you go about designing uh, the stage to enhance the telling of the story by the actors. Next week, we're going to be doing a little bit more on that. But this week, all I wanted to do was discuss what we actually mean by the term the stage, um, because it's an all-embracing term and it can mean different things to different people and it can have different preferences for different people. But let's remind ourselves, first of all, uh, the great dictum of, of uh, Peter Brook about the stage. I'm going to read the quote again that I, I quoted last week. I can take an empty space and call it a stage. That's important. I can take an empty space and call it a stage. A man walks across this empty space while someone else is watching him. And this is all I need for an act of theater to be engaged. Now, when you look at that in its absolutely fundamental, simple purity, that stage is anywhere where someone does something and someone else watches. It is the ultimate description of the theatrical experience. Um, that is why when we're talking about colleges and universities, we talk about a lecture theater. Even in, we, we call that place where you have your bowels delved into um, an operating theater. We call it that because in times gone by, while somebody was sawing into you, a group of other people would be watching them how they do it. It's that same fundamental principle. Whatever that space is, if somebody is uh, walking across or, or doing something within that empty space and someone is watching, that is all you need for an act of theater to be engaged. Most people, when you talk about stages, most people have a personal preference when they're watching a play. Oh, I don't like that kind of thing. I don't like that kind of staging. Oh, I like it when this happens. Oh, I like to see, you know, you can, this, this preference is usually based on the very early experience of theater, of going to the theater, of seeing theater. And for the word preference, you can read the word prejudice. Because in most people, a preference is in fact a prejudice. They are prejudiced in favor of something and against something else. They prefer it. It is preferred because that is their particular prejudice. I don't mean that in a nasty sense. I just simply mean what you are used to or what you've been taught or what you have experienced in early life tends to decide what you like when you see something. But in all stages, any aspect of stage, whatever that may be, and we're going to discuss a few in a, in, in a moment, Peter Brook's dictum still holds good. Regardless of what that stage is, the principle of theater still holds good. All stages are an empty space until an act of theater happens. And my personal belief, my personal prejudice, if you like, is that for two and a half thousand years, we've never really improved on that original thought, which is where Brooke was, was driving his attention when he talked about the empty space. The primary empty space would be wherever humans gathered to hear or watch a story being told or danced. Initially, maybe a cave, maybe later on, um, when hunter-gatherers became adept at, at, at uh, farming, maybe the common space of a village, or inside a hut, or later on, a cottage, anywhere where a group of people gather together in an agreed space to listen to or watch a story being told or enacted. That's the empty space that Brooke is talking about. That is the act of theater taking place um, 
And that formalization of such a thing began the evolution of what we now know as, as theater and stages. That, um, for instance, I, I, I've mentioned before the Irish term Shanachi, the teller of tales, the person who would go in, in the village, they, they would gather in the cottage and they would, they would take water and they would have something to eat and they would gather and there'd be the bit of dance and, and then the person would start, sit beside the fire and start to tell a story and people would gather round and that is all you require for an act of theatre to take place. It's, it's the fundamental of Brooks' empty space. Now, always in this concept, the actor and the audience share the common empty space. The actor and the audience are together within this space. That's fundamental to it, that it's not separated the way we are, for instance, that there is a camera and me sitting here in Pittsburgh and you wherever you happen to be in America or the world. No, this fundamental of theatre is that the actor and the audience share this empty space, a common space. But in the creation of a formalized space for theatre, we've grown, as, as, we, as we basically understand it, um, certain criteria have become required. Uh, and again, required not in, in an absolute fundamental way. It's just that they have evolved. I think evolved is a better word than required. The criteria for theater has, has evolved. But there are two things that are absolute in the creation of a theatrical space. The ability to see what is happening and the ability to hear what is happening. And the space, whatever that space may be, must provide both of those fundamental criteria that you can see the person in the empty space and you can hear them. And once that happens, the act of theater is made possible. So the search for such a space leads us to, um, because of those requirements, leads us to what we might describe as the natural amphitheater. And notice in using that phrase, I'm using a theater phrase to describe a natural phenomenon. Uh, even though it is natural, you know, a, a side of a hill or a, a natural um, a semicircular space, um, we use the term amphitheater because we understand it um, and we have understood it for over two and a half, half thousand years. So let's take a look at a natural amphitheater. And what I mean by that, we have a picture. There it is. Now here you see a theatrical space has been created in what is fundamentally a natural amphitheater. And it provides two things. It provides the opportunity to rise above the performance area and surrounded by, by rock or whatever, you have the natural acoustic that allows voices to be contained within the space and have points for reverberation within the space. Once the dynamics of such a space were understood by the early proponents of, of this form of storytelling, um, our theatrical forebears, who are, of course, the Greeks, perfected this architecture or this, this architectural concept, both in terms of temples, which, and a temple or a church is another form of empty space where somebody does something and a group of people watch. There is no difference. And the, the correlation between the Greek temple and the Greek theater um, demonstrates that. So when we take a look at what the Greeks did with that concept, our next uh, picture will show uh, the Greek th theater, which is actually in Sicily, which was Greek at one point, not Italian. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually nestling under Mount Etna in the background, which looks like it's just about to explode, being a rather famous volcano. But here you see that concept has been taken into an architectural construct. So you, here you have your fundamental empty space where someone can walk across and people can watch and an act of theater can take place. Now, interestingly, 
we still use many of the terms that the Greeks, um, by, which, by which the Greeks delineated the areas of the, 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 this, this empty space. Uh, we still use the terms uh, scene for, from the scene of the, the, the backstage area, the back of the stage that the Greeks created. We use the term orchestra still, but for, the or for them, the orchestra was the, the, that area in front of the scene um, where the actors performed and the musicians performed. Nothing has changed. We still put the musicians in, a, in, a, in, in, in an opera or uh, uh, in, in an orchestra pit. Uh, we put them in a pit. We call it the orchestra pit, in, uh, which is a term we've inherited after two and a half thousand years uh, from the Greeks. So these, even the very terms that we use, um, go back to this this initial concept of the creation of a space. And when you look at that space, and I'm going to come back to this later on, it has all the essential requirements for an act of theatre to take place. And the most important of these is that the actor, the action and the audience, the person walking across the space and the person watching are actually in a shared common location. The audience is with the actor. The actor is with the audience. It's deeply important. And that stays true for a very, very, very long time. Um, but you have in that the... The, the, the visibility and the containment of sound, those two essentials which are required for, for, for an act of theatre to happen or to be successful. Um, and also within that stage, you have a new ability, the ability to use scenic construction or even technical effects. And Greek theatre was full of it. Um, but they could create a scene and they could introduce technical effects. Um, if, if you had fire-breathing gods, you could actually have fire-breathing in that space because behind that scene at the back, you could have whatever mechanics uh, you required in order to introduce that. But fundamentally, the actor was the embodiment of the performance. Everything else was the single backdrop. Um, and in spite of all the, 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 the machinery that they could at that point um, include, central to it, foremost, was the actor and the actor and the audience sharing that common space. Deeply important. Now, the Romans copied it. Um, Roman theatres basically followed that format of the amphitheatre. Um, I know we have things like the Colosseum and the Field of Mars and all of those things, but that was for killing people. Uh, Theatres were for entertaining people. They might bore them to death, but they entertained them as well. But that fundamental Greek principle of the amphitheatre stayed true for a very long time. Then, after the fall of the Roman Empire, after the Dark Ages and, and beyond, um, acting didn't stop. You know, we are the second oldest profession in the world and we've kept going and we always will keep going. Uh, but actors found different methodologies or different, sorry, different uh, 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 mechanisms for presenting drama. And one of them was, of course, the strolling player. Um, Shakespeare mentions that kind of thing very much in Hamlet. We all know about the play scene in Hamlet and the, the players coming in on a cart and... Uh, and, and giving a performance wherever they were. And it was that ability to do that, that understanding of that fundamental that had been established by the Greeks, that all you needed was an empty space and somewhere for people to sit and watch or stand and watch, and you could create a theatrical experience. So the strolling players who would go from town to town, village to village would create what was still happening, believe it or not, in the beginning part of the 20th century, the fit-up concept, that when you moved into a place, you would find, into a town or a village, you would find an appropriate space and you would fit up. You would just create an acting area and an audience area that had differed very little in what was then about 2,000 years. Um, uh, but right through again to the early part of the 20th century, I know in Ireland they were still traveling doing this kind of thing. You can build a stage out of a few few planks and some beer barrels. That's all you need to create 
an empty space. So on the back of a wag wagon and using whatever uh, auditoria they can find. Now, I'm going to give you an example of here of one of the things that I think was intrinsic to the next stage of development. Every town had an inn and every most inns had a courtyard. And if we look at the next slide, we can see what I'm talking about. There is your classic, that's a very Tudor looking um, country inn um, with windows up high with a flat area. And the concept that you would walk in and set up a platform and people would stand around and watch the play and people who had more money could stay inside and look out of the windows or if there were balconies, they would stand on the balconies to observe the play. This is leading to a particular form of theater design, which you may already be working out. Um, but this simple concept that that picture that you're looking at is a theater in all its potential. It has a space for the groundlings to stand. It has space for a platform to be set up. It has places for posh people with money to watch out of the rain uh, and in the comfort and if it had a balcony, it could be full of people watching as well. So here you have a fundamental origin still based on that absolutely then ancient principle of actors and audience in a common space where a person can walk across that empty space and another can watch him and an act of theatre can take place. You can control the sound, you have clear visibility. As I say, a space for groundlings, a space on balconies or behind windows for posh people. And this actually would eventually lead to the development of a formal theater based on a line of theater construction that leads right back to the Greeks, to the development of the first true playhouse as we might understand it as opposed to the open air amphitheater the playhouse still open air to a degree but much more uh contained in other words we lead to the development of the, uh, the elizabethan stage the elizabethan playhouse and in that sense we're talking about as you are probably well aware theaters such as the rose or the globe or the theater which was shakespeare's original uh, venue. And there's a picture of what the interior of the Rose or the Globe, I think that is the Globe, um, would look like. And what do you see but exactly the same thing as you saw in the what, the, what the courthouse of the inn, the potential it offered, is simply formalized here. But you are still seeing the scene at the back, you are seeing the orchestra or stage area you are seeing the tiered ranks of the audience with the poor people standing at the front and the richer people sitting uh, further back. But the comparison between this and the amphitheater is so clear. It hasn't changed. It is still that same concept. Yes, it's open to the sky, but the people, well, the richer people have got some kind of a roof over their heads. It is, um, it is formalized in its structure. It's formalized as a theater building, but nothing else has changed. The actual fundamentals of theater shape and theater function still remain. Um, you've still got all those advantages of actor and audience sharing a space that you can control and you, uh, the visibility of the actor you can control the audibility and the acoustic because it is contained within this, as Shakespeare put it, this wooden O. The concept is incredibly simple. The concept is incredibly Greek, but its, its effect on theater was quite extraordinary. This, this formalization of a structure prompted an explosion. I mean, quite literally an explosion of creative and particularly of writing talent for the theater. Suddenly there was, a, there was a formula of presentation that gave writers a much clearer picture of, they were no longer on carts traveling around, they were no longer in courtyards. Here was the concept of a building in which 
their work as writers could really blossom, could explode, in fact. And yet they still followed in their writing an awful lot of the classic um, writing concepts and structures. Uh, if you look at the plays of Shakespeare or of Marlowe or of Webster or of any of them, um, you are seeing plays written regardless of location and space, that location and space was told to you. Um, you know, what country friend is this? This is Illyria lady. And now we know we're in Illyria. Um, that the writers simply had to tell you where you were and you accepted it. Your willing suspension of disbelief, that goes back a long way too, was functioning. Um, the orchestra or stage was whatever the actor and writer told you it was and you accepted it. You didn't need any elaboration beyond that. It was simply the relationship between the actor and the audience and any special effects that might happen were simple and, and location enhancing. Um, that particular stage would have a balcony uh, over it so that when Shakespeare wrote uh, Juliet appears above, we know exactly where she's going to appear. She's going to be on the balcony. That's why we call it the balcony scene, even though it has nothing to do with the balcony. Um, so what we're seeing here, this this really, and, I, and that's why I always say that this particular period of, of, of playwriting was the second great major development in theatre. The first being the Greeks who invented it, the next being the Elizabethans, and not just the Elizabethans, but um, also around Europe, but, uh, you know, we accept the Elizabethan as a particular period. Um, this was the next great explosion. The concept of the playhouse constructed specifically for the way people acted and the way people wrote and the way people wanted to view the play within a single space shared by the actor and the audience, the shared experience of theatre. You might say that this kind of stage was Greek theater made new. It, had, it was still Greek theater, it was still Greek concept, but it had been made new in the fashion of the time with the equipment of the time. Um, the technological equipment of the time was based on timber, the Greeks based it on stone, but fundamentally still the same space. Then something very significant happened, and it happened in English theatre, and most of our English-speaking Western theatre is derived from English theatre, so we'll stick with that line of thought for this purpose of this exercise. But something very significant happened after the, um, the uh, Jacobean period, which followed the Elizabethan, um, a, a king was dethroned and his head was chopped off, Charles I. And in came the Puritans, and the Puritans, being pure, absolutely loathed theatre. So all the theatres were closed. Many of them were lost. Some were burnt down, timbers of some were used for building meeting houses or other things. But the theatre as we knew it disappeared. And it was only with the restoration of Charles II that theatre came back into, um, into England and into English writing and to England, English acting. Um, and from that, all of us, Irish, Scots, American, whatever, all the English speaking world can, can trace their, uh, their, their line back to. But it wasn't just the fact that Charles II came back and the monarchy was restored. He introduced a new kind of theater. We call it the Restoration Period for the obvious reason that it was during the restoration of the monarchy. But he also brought with him the Restoration Stage. Now, he had lived in France and traveled in Italy. And the influence in France over this period had been the Italian influence. And Italian art was the picture frame. And now we introduce ourselves to something really very different. Yes, you have the audience. Yes, you have the space. 
but the space is behind a huge picture frame behind which artists, painters, sculptors even, could create moving, changing scenery. They could paint pictures and the totality of that stage was the play. Not merely the actors acting and the audience watching, but the, the scenery and the mechanisms that could be adopted behind a picture frame. In, in, a, in, in some senses, the actors themselves became a part of the picture rather than the picture just being there to enhance the actors. And some of the mechanisms of this were really incredible. They could, they could fly scenery in and out and bring it on from the sides and change the picture within the frame to an incredible degree. The restoration stage was something completely different. The principle is still there, actors act, audience watch, but there's another intrinsic difference to this, which we'll look at in our next picture. Now, as I say, scenery became dominant. So here we've got a diagram of what a proscenium stage actually looks like. And there's a very important point I'll come to in a second. But as you can see within that diagram, you have the audience, which is to your right, and you have the stage, which is to your left. And above the stage, you have this vast empty area in which enormous amounts of scenery could be hung and flown in and out uh, by men with ropes, usually sailors, because they were very used to working with, with ropes at that period. Um, underneath the stage, there are dressing rooms, um, which in the uh, Shakespearean theater would have been behind the stage, the tiring room, as it was known. Um, but the most important point about this is that we've moved from one empty space to two. That the actors and the audience are no longer in the same space or the same room, if you like. They're in separate rooms. The actors on the stage, the audience in the auditorium. But there is a wall between them. The wall has got a hole poked through it called the proscenium arch through which you can see the action. But they're no longer in as much contact. The audience are no longer sharing the space with the actors. They're viewing it from a different perspective, from a, from a different room. And for instance, a curtain would actually separate the audience from the action until such time as you wanted, uh, as, as, as the, the performance began. But what the audience would be greeted with very often was a large curtain blocking off, keeping them separate from the room where the actors operate. Um, a whole new set of rubrics, terms of definition would develop because of this, such things as flying the scenery, uh, because it literally flew up into the air. Um, so we still describe that area in theatres as the flies. And even in modern theatres where it doesn't exist, we'll often use that term. It, it came from that period. Even the term that we still use at the beginning of a show, and stage managers will often use, curtain up. Whether there's a curtain or not, when a play begins, there is still that notion of curtain up, that the curtain goes up and a play begins. In other words, curtain rises and the audience is allowed to look through the hole in the wall and see the action take place. And when the action is completed, the curtain comes down and the two are separated again. So to my mind, and I'm prejudiced, the proscenium stage had limitations, no limitations on what was possible behind it, but very much a limitation on how the audience and the actors could relate to one another on a direct level. But as with just about everything in, in, in theory in life, um, we, we do tend to have to re-examine the past to find the future. And even in the creation of the proscenium stage, that there was a fundamental basis of the Greek idea in terms of audience and actor watching. 
that fundamental of visibility and audibility. So when these proscenium uh, style theatres were built, and just about every modern opera house you ever go to is based on this principle, that the auditorium, the auditoria, that area where the audience sit is acoustically um, constructed so that the, the audience can hear the actors and that the space that the actors work on is clearly visible at all times to the audience. Now you look at some of these theaters, they're vast. Um, and you sort of, how can anybody be heard in such a space? Because the acoustic has been designed to make this possible. Um, I remember many, oh, many, many years ago uh, on tour in Ireland, and it was the first time I ever played the Opera House in Belfast, which is an exquisite theater built by a man called Frank Matcham. And he was renowned for his acoustics. And um, he went through different phases of theater building. There was his elephant phase and his cherub phase. Um, and Belfast, I think, is, is one of the elephant houses, as it were. And you think all this wonderful decor, why bother? Because it was all part of the acoustic. It was all part of ensuring that words spoken on the stage by an actor would be heard in the back row, 70, 80, 100 feet away and three floors up. Those, those fundamental rubrics must always be observed. And that's why I hate seeing actors on stage with microphones. They should be heard if the theater is good and they've been trained properly. Sorry, a little bit of prejudice there. But um, so that principle of, of, of ancient theater still held true. But the major difference was this separation of the two. But as I say, we, we re-examine the past constantly. And in so doing, very often we follow that fundamental rule, rule, and it's true in architecture, it's true in well, just about anything to do with construction. Um, we go back to basics. And in this sort of re-examination back in the 60s, this started to happen a lot. The creation of theatre in the round. Now, here is a very large example of it. Uh, many of you may have experienced theatre in the round in much smaller uh, environments. This picture just shows you, I'm, I'm using this because it shows you to a large extent that nothing had changed over two and a half thousand years except they removed the scene concept or the scene at the back and went with the idea that you could encompass the entire empty space with an audience. And by so doing, you're bringing the audience and the actor back into an absolutely personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. That the person in the front row and the person in the back row are still in the same room that the action is taking place in. You are having a shared experience with the actor. The same space allowed in the round for the entire concept of scenery to completely disappear. There was no need for it. All you had was that fundamental of the actor acting and the audience watching. Closeness, closeness between the two, actor and audience, became the overriding factor and of intimately shared experience. And believe me, I, I do not know, I, I don't think there is a play that's been written that cannot be presented in the round as well as it can be presented on a thrust stage or a proscenium stage. And uh, uh, if any of you know the plays of Alan Akeborn, uh, who uh, was a, still is, I think he's still there, uh, brilliant writer of, of comedy, stunning writer of comedy, and whose plays were the toast of the West End for years and years and years and years and years, and years usually presented on proscenium stages, but all of them were premiered at his theater in Scarborough in England, which was a theater in the round. So every play that he put on into the West End on a proscenium stage began its life as theater in the round. The only thing the theater in the round demands is that there is an empty space and someone walking across it and someone else watching them. Nothing else matters. And just as with Shakespeare, if you need to know where you are, you'll usually find it in the text. If you need to know who the people are, they usually tell you in the text. Theater is about communication 
not about buildings. Theatre is about the interaction, the shared experience between audience and actors, not about buildings. So I want to go back now and to the Greeks. And this is the ultimate, probably, in ancient theatre design. This is the theatre at Ephesus. And as I said, when we talked about the uh, earlier one, the earlier Greek theatre in Sicily, here is the perfect example of the construct of theatre. Any theatre, anywhere, anytime. Because when you look at that picture, you can see the globe. You can see Shakespeare's theatre is there. That idea of a stage jutting out into an audience that can see him, or see the actor, hear the actor, be aware completely of what is going on, and share the experience. And this is the other important fact. If you cast your mind back to the picture of the of, of the, uh, the Globe Theatre, um, they can see themselves. That the audience is sharing the space, not simply with the actor, but with each other. They can look across and see the reaction of audience on the other side. Here you see it on Shakespeare's stage. It is exactly the same thing, but it's brought down in scale. It's constructed with timber. It's got a roof on it, but it is still fundamentally the same thing, the same experience. And the audience, the ones in the pit, uh, the orchestra pit, um, are jostled together, shoulder to shoulder. The people sitting on the balconies are sitting close together. It's one of those simple rules of theatre that an audience should be slightly uncomfortable and slightly too close to one another because they act as a single entity. And the Greeks understood this. So there you see the Greek theatre that Shakespeare used. Let's go back to Ephesus again, and you'll see the Shakespearean theatre that the Greeks used. It's the same thing. Slightly different in dimension, slightly different in, in shape, but the fundamental principle is there. And when all of those rows of seating were filled, and there might have been a, a thousand or more people crammed together, they are sharing that experience, not merely with the actor, but with each other, because of the nature of the construct. Think about it. You go to a modern movie house, go and see a movie. And, um, or a cinema, as my friends in Ireland and the UK would say. Um, you will be sitting in seats that are very plush and very wide with somewhere to put your beaker of soda or your, pe your popcorn and you're not in contact with the person on either side of you. So you tend to watch a movie on your own, even though you might be in a crowded uh, movie house. In the theatre, we don't like that. We want you touching one another. We want you together. We want you to experience it as an audience not as single audience members. It's that same construct that the Greeks had at Ephesus, where everybody sat together in the open, together in contact, in contact with each other and in contact with the actors. Which I believe, and um, I'm going to move on to the, uh, it, the influence is, it's still with us. It never goes away, no matter what you do. The proscenium was, to my mind, an aberration. But the fundamental theatre design has never, ever gone away. And the last uh, slide I want to show you is of a particular theatre um, in Canada at Stratford, the thrust stage at uh, Stratford, Ontario, which is um, probably as close as you get in modern theatres to that fundamental Greek concept, a scene behind the orchestra area where the actors perform in front and thrusting out and, and, and the seating all the way around uh, on the three sides of that. This is, to my mind, the perfect performing space. This is the space on which anything is possible because nothing overly defines it. You can take away those steps at the back, you can take away that platform at the back and you still have an acting space. You can add more to it. You can hang things above it, you can have explosions, you can have things growing out of it, but it is still that fundamental acting space. It's as Greek as you could wish, and it is as modern as you can wish. 
It has two thirds of all the advantages of theater in the round. The one thing it doesn't do, the most important thing in my mind that it doesn't do, because you can do multiple things on that. I mean, you can do opera on that stage. You can do, uh, you can do dance on that stage. You can do plays on that stage. It is limitless in its possibilities. Nothing is restricting the art of performing. Everything is open. It is the empty space in which somebody can walk across and somebody can, uh, but you can see in that, I hope, that absolute line of descent from the Greeks through the courtyard, through the Elizabethan stage, down to that modern concept of thrust, theater in the round, three quarter round, deep thrust stage, they're all exactly the same. The only aberration from that being the restoration or proscenium stage. But the important point, and I come back to it, that whatever can be done behind a proscenium can be done just as well, if not better, on this format. Because this format is both brand new and incredibly ancient. And every time we reinvent the theater space, we come back. It's, it's like one of those, those it's like uh, the series of primary numbers. The mathematical primary number of theater is what the Greeks invented. That notion that Peter Brook defined, that all you need is an empty space, somebody to walk across it and somebody to watch. And within that limitation and recognizing the fact that the space where the actor performs must be clearly visible and the space in which the audience sit must reverberate with the sound that the actor makes, that you can see it and you can hear it clearly. That is all you need for an act of theater. And interestingly on that point, generally speaking, where audiences find it difficult to hear or to see tends to be far more in a proscenium based playhouse than it does in, in any other, in what we might call the, the Greek concept. Because proscenium based playhouses have restricted vision. That picture frame, if you're sitting to the side, can interfere with your line of vision. And if you are too far back on the stage, the proscenium can interfere with the projection of the voice. So even on its very fundamental level, the proscenium has weaknesses that the other forms do not have. And I believe that that's why proscenium is the lesser of uh, the evils that sometimes theatres offer to actors when they try to perform. Uh, sorry, it's the worser of the evils. Um, if you can do it, I mean, it's a fundamental rule. If you're out there thinking, I'm going to build a theater, don't put a proscenium. Think, think Greek, always think Greek. And that fundamentally, and I'm ahead of myself at the moment, uh, but that fundamentally is my, um, my, my point for this week. Um, and I think you'll find if you, if you listen regularly to these webinars, you'll find that I will very often go back to that fun, you know, back to the Greeks, always back to the Greeks, because out of them, out of their, out of their imagination of what was theater, out of that came everything we have done since. Now, Oriental theater, different line of derivation. Um, and I am no expert. On, I'm not a particularly expert on anything, but I'm certainly no expert on that. So I, 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 I do actually hope to address that. I want to discuss um, Oriental theater, particularly no theater and, and Kabuki, but only when I can get an appropriate expert to come on with me because I'll be learning as well. Uh, there's a question coming up straight away. How does your approach to direction and staging change from proscenium stage to thrust or alley stage? Well, I'll come to alley stage in a minute, but it's a good question. Directing is directing is directing. Um, acting is acting is acting. Proscenium offers problems because we have, when part of what I was talking about, when you have a proscenium at the stage, you have to be aware of a thing that we hate called sight lines. Um, how much of the stage the audience can see regardless of where they're sitting. And if they're sitting to the side, they will see less of the stage because the proscenium will get in the way. So we have this, this strange thing called sight lines that we have to work with it. Um, when you are dealing with 
a proscenium, you must always be conscious that 100% of the people who are watching you are in one direction. It tends to remove natural behavior. You have to sometimes adjust natural behavior to ensure that the 100% of the people who are watching who are in one direction um, are able to actually see it. Um, it adjusts somewhat the way you vocalize. So it doesn't change the way you interpret and it doesn't necessarily change the um, your, the conceptualization of the piece or turning this, the script into, into the spoken and, and acted word, but it does, um, it does change the way you stage it uh, so that you are always presenting the picture forward. And that can be sometimes difficult. I'm blessed with the fact that um, I, 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 don't, I no longer have to worry about that because we deal with an open open stage area. We've been using an end stage concept. We're moving to a thrust stage concept with our next season. Um, uh, yes, I agree with you. It's wonderful that must see, must hear includes ASL. Um, but again, even, even the act of ASL um, is better when you have an open stage because you can place the interpreter in such a position that they are part of the action. Um, they're always running a commentary through ASL on the action in which they are engaged, that the audience, the actors, and the ASL interpreter are all within that same scope of, uh, of, of, of the stage, the actor to audience relationship. I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, What's, uh, the door slamming conceit of farce is just a conceit, but I'm not creative enough to imagine how to do all those overheard conversations, timed entrances, and exits in the round. Well, you can. I've done it. Um, you have to be ingenious, which I'm not, but I will always work with ingenious designers. Anything that you can do on a proscenium can be done in the round, on the thrust. Um, it's all possible. Sometimes it is a matter of very clever use of the imagination, but fast, for instance, can work perfectly well, provided you, provided the production and the actors have set the, the rules of the game, the rules of engagement, and the audience accept that, and, and we all play by the rules. Anything is possible, and uh, I, I won't go into it too deeply. I, I, I want to do another program on the topic of fast at a later point, because our discussion on, on farce and tragedy went down so well before. But yes, it can be done. Um, but it is a matter of, of audience accepting. One of the advantages of, for instance, the classic farce thing of somebody outside a door overhearing is that you can play it in such a way that part of the audience knows there's somebody behind the door and the other part of the audience can see them listening. Well, we did that, for instance, I was in a production of uh, School for Scandal many years ago. I was playing Peter Teasel. And because of the nature of the way we constructed it, you could see Sir Peter listening in at the conversation that he was overhearing, which in a way sort of made it funnier. So there are distinct advantages to what an open stage will give you over, over what a proscenium stage will restrict. Does that answer that question? Hope so. Big question. Uh, so, next week. Now, this week I have talked about the evolution of um, the stage from the Greek with its aberration into the proscenium. I didn't mention one particular form of staging. And it is another variation on the Greek stage. And we call it the alley stage. And the, uh, we describe it as the alley stage because it's a, a, a very good description. If you imagine that the audience is on two sides of the room and that down the middle is an alley, or an area. So you've got the two halves of the audience facing one another and in the middle, you present the play. I find the alley stage and most actors find the alley stage incredibly satisfying. They find it so interesting to work on because for once they do not have to worry about where they're looking. They can just look at each other. And the audience is, as it were, 
in the same room, sharing the experience, but looking in on something. Now, four years ago, I think we presented a season of plays when Pict was operating in Union Project. Um, we operated, um, we did a series of five productions on an alley stage, and there were very different plays, very different. And so I decided, because I, I knew, uh, I was directing four of them, I was in one, um, but I chose one designer to design all five productions as a kind of experiment for both him and for me and the company as to how you could, you know, people would say, well, what can you do with a space like that? Well, we did five very, very different productions, five very, very different scenic designs from a very brilliant local designer here in Pittsburgh, John Michael Bohuk, who will be joining me next week to discuss the solutions we found, both as director and designer, and in one case as actor, um, throughout that whole season that we did on the Alley stage. So that will be next week. We will have John Michael joining us. We will have pretty pictures to show you of how the initial concepts were thought through and what the result was in terms of, of the scenic look. Um, and for those of you interested, the five plays we did were The One Woman Show, Shirley Valentine, um, The Lion in Winter, Merchant of Venice, Oedipus Rex, and John B. Keane's play, Sive. Five incredibly different pieces, five incredibly different results in one incredibly fascinating space. So I hope that you will join in next week and uh, listen to that. Um, if there are any more questions you want to ask, if anything's come up or you think about something afterwards, always remember you can email and we will always get back to you. And um, can I, I thank yet again, um, Sandra Williamson for uh, sponsoring today's program. If you want to sponsor, get in touch with us. We'll let you know how, it's terribly easy. Uh, if you can donate, now we're running into our spring fundraising season. So any dollars, any punts, what pounds, euros, lotties, whatever you have, whatever you can send, we really do appreciate it. Every small donation counts. Nothing is too small. A bit bigger is nicer, but nothing is too small. Please do think about it. Um, we will be... We won't be back on stage probably until October, November, uh, when we're allowed to go back on stage, but we want to come back with a bang. And in order to do that, we have to pay our bills. So please, 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 if you can send a few, a few dollars, a few euro, whatever it is in your own domain, please think of doing so. Go to our website. There's a button there to press to donate. Thank you for being with me as usual. I will, I hope see you all with your friends you're going to tell all about it next week and i've joined as i say with john michael bohawk we're going to be talking about the alley stage and its delights in the meantime oh by the way good news for me i got my first vaccination i'm so happy <laughs> in the mean if you haven't and even if you have take good care wash your hands wear your mask look after yourselves thank you so much bye now <laughs>